Hi, in this video we're going to have a look at the FY6900 Arbitrary Signal Generator. Now hopefully many of you saw my original video on the FY3200S. Uh, that was many years ago now and the problem this particular signal generator had was the outputs were floating up at around 90 or 100 volts with a relatively high leakage current. So if you were probing around in some very sensitive circuitry with your signal generator, uh, there was a chance that you could damage your electronics. So uh, following that video, um, the company did actually contact me to say that they were going to modify some things and they asked if uh, what they had suggested was okay. So we'll have a little look at what they've done on the later models because I've not seen any of the uh, signal generators ever since this one. But uh, since I modified this one with a linear regulator and a proper transformer and everything in here, this one's been really good and I've been using this quite happily for the past few years. Um, I guess the only criticism really is that the user interface is a bit um, old school, a little bit uh, clunky, and I'm hoping that this new version will be a little bit better with its colour TFT display. But I've not really played around with this one too much yet, so we'll have a look at that later in the video. So this was sent to me by Banggood, and I've received the 60 MHz version, but there are different versions available, and in addition to the bandwidth changing, in fact it changes the output voltage capability. So the 60 MHz version can only output up to 5 volts peak to peak on the output, and I think the 20 MHz version can output up to 24 volts peak to peak. So depending on which one you choose, uh, you'll be able to drive it, uh, drive different loads on the output. So I'll put links down to the Banggood listing in the description down below, but what we'll do first is we'll have a look inside and see what the electronics looks like, uh, and then we'll give it a test afterwards because um, I want to check that the power supply is all safe first. There's just one screw on the bottom here and then I think the back cover pops off. It looks like you can stick a, a pry tool in the bottom there uh, to get the back off and then it separates in two halves. But I did want to quickly talk about the construction and the form factor. So when I was looking at this on the Banggood website, it's a little bit difficult to gauge quite how big this is, but I think it's only around 200 millimeters wide. It's also incredibly light and the plastics do feel sort of very low cost plasticky. So there's no rubberized bumps on here. Um, these are just sort of aesthetic, but the tilting bell works quite nicely and you can sit it completely flat if you've got a stack of equipment. So the overall construction is not too bad. Basically we've got the front panel with the LCD and the buttons and the LEDs and that has its own self-contained PCB with an STM32 microcontroller and then that goes off onto two ribbon cables to go to the main board. So that construction is not too bad at all. That keeps everything so, sort of associated with the user interface, all separated from the signal generation. Then we've got the actual signal generator PCB, which we'll have a look at in a minute, with the BNCs uh, mounted on there. And those do actually look like nice high quality connectors, nice and rigid onto the PCB, a USB interface and some uh, digital inputs and outputs. And then we've got the power supply. So here we've got the power supply for the device and it looks pretty similar to the last one. It's uh, the plus 5 volts ground and then plus and minus 12 volts. So the same output voltages. It may even be the same PCB as last time. Uh, but it is still inherently a class 2 power supply design. So that means it wasn't originally designed to be connected to mains earth. And it has all the EMC designed um, around a class 2 power supply. So basically the main mechanism for getting noise out onto your electronics is the interwinding capacitance on your transformer. So any switching noise easily gets coupled through the transformer to the DC side and there's no means of getting it back to the primary side. So what they do is they add this little capacitor here. This is a special safety capacitor which is designed to uh, fail open circuit rather than short circuit. So you know over time there's no risk of the main, uh, the low voltage side becoming live but it's designed so that you get the return current path back through this capacitor and then back onto this side. By bypassing that with the ground connection here, um, you're sort of defeating the general purpose and the loop is a lot longer. So this could be worse EMC wise because now all of your noise is being conducted back through this cable, back through your earth wiring, all the way back to the start point on the transformer or um, at the meter depending on your earthen arrangement and then back to the electronics here. So you've actually got a much wider area for the EMC emissions. So this isn't ideal 
But the main criticism that I've really got is that this wire here is plain ribbon cable and is not designed for mains use. It's not got insulation rated to 350 volts, which is the peak of the AC waveform. Therefore, if this wire was to sit you know, against the PCB and start touching some of the live parts, this insulation technically isn't rated for that. And there is a chance that the insulation could break down and then all of your electronics could become live. So I think we'll have to fix that. Um, I've got some mains wire. This is uh, slightly thicker than it needs to be, but this has the correct insulation and thickness and is designed for that purpose. So we'll swap this out for this wiring. The actual power supply looks fine. Um, it's got the isolation here and you can see that they've drawn a box around that side of things. And there's only the transformer, the safety cap and the opto isolator bridging that gap. They have been a little bit naughty, so it shouldn't really have a glass fuse because the prospective fault current, uh, particularly in the UK, is in excess of 1000 amps typically. So that means if you shorted the phase and the neutral together, the current flowing for that brief period until something triggers is well in excess of 1000 amps and glass fuses like this just tend to explode. In the regulations it's actually stated that these should be ceramic and sand filled so that they don't rupture in that way. There's not really very much going on on the display board. We've got an STM32 microcontroller, a 3.3 volt regulator and a capacitor, a crystal, uh, and then a, uh, a little MOSFET here for driving the backlight on the LCD. Uh, but there's not really much else. I think there's a couple of LEDs on the other side and it's mainly just buttons and uh, a little transistor here for driving the piezo. So the actual signal generator PCB isn't too bad at all really. Uh, we've got some fairly decent BNC connectors which are rigidly mounted to the PCB. We've got some NEC relays. Two of them are switching in and out the 50 ohms termination and it looks like these two are doing some gain switching on these two output op amps. But the, uh, the main output drivers are underneath this little heat sink. Then we've got various other um, op amps here uh, clearly doing some feedback into the FPGA which is a Cyclone 4. And then we've got our two DACs, one for each channel. Uh, we can't tell what they are because they've been lasered off so you can't read what they are for whatever reason. Uh, but nothing too surprising really on the PCB layout. Got various voltage regulation and general support circuitry, some more regulators here. A CH340 for the USB interface. Um, and that's about it really. Um, we've got some uh, 74 series logic just to uh, read the inputs and outputs on these BNC connectors at the back which are for the voltage controlled oscillator in, for um, the various types of modulation, and then we've got the sync out and the sync in. Um, but yeah, it's pretty similar sort of general feel as the previous version, it's just that they've made it bigger, uh, a little bit more capable, and um, yeah, they've separated out the front panel because it's got all of the uh, LCD to drive. So here's my temporary repair using some earth cable and a bit of heat shrink at each end. Um, and I think this is good enough for now. I probably will end up replacing this power supply at some point when I find one that's suitable, uh, but this should be fine for now. And just to illustrate the point, here's the ribbon cable wire that was being used previously, and this is the earth wire. And you can see the difference in insulation thickness is quite considerable. And the insulation thickness is independent of the current carrying capability of the wire. So even though this is quite thick, I think it's 1.5 millimeters square, if you used 0.5 millimeter square wire, it should still have this same insulation thickness, which this one does not. So you can see uh, there's quite a discrepancy there. And I thought it might be interesting just to see if we can get the insulation to break down. So I've got a bit of foil, which I'm gonna wrap around the wire here, just around the insulation, and that's just poking out the end. So there's no contact directly between the foil and the inner conductor. And we'll see if we can get the insulation to break down. It may do nothing, I don't know. Let's have a look. So just testing it on continuity. Uh, if we press the test button, we can read that the impedance is greater than uh, 2000 ohms. So that's using sort of a low voltage method. Then we can do the insulation test. And we've got 1000 volts selected, which is our uh, typical maximum that we'd ever want to test at. And we'll see what we get here. You can hear it crackling away. It's reading about 2 meg ohms and going down. So uh, we have broken down the insulation there, which suggests it's not suitable for 1,000 volts. It was probably okay 
at 250 volts, but we are getting some uh, lower readings. I probably should have tested it in order and worked my way up. So the user interface on the device is not too bad, actually. Um, the knob is a little bit flimsy on the rotary encoder, but other than that, it's pretty much fine. Um, so you can easily change the frequency, and it does have the ability to move the cursor across with these left and right buttons, so you can quickly do coarse or fine control. Now, if you want to change the amplitude, you can just press the button along here, offset, uh, duty cycle, which doesn't make sense on a sine wave, and then the phase, so you can quickly adjust the phase between channel 1 and channel 2, and you can see on the oscilloscope that that is changing. So the sine wave functionality is absolutely fine, and the sine wave can output up to 60 megahertz on the 60 megahertz model. For the square wave generation, you can have up to 0 to 25 megahertz, and then for all the others, including the arbitrary waveform, um, the maximum is 0 to 10 megahertz. And the arbitrary waveform generator has an 8 kilobits um, memory width, and each point is a 14-bit output. So it's got a 14-bit DAC on the output of this, so quite a lot of resolution there. Um, so you can get some really nice arbitrary waveforms. Now apparently a lot of things that people complained about in the previous model, the FY6800, is the jitter that occurs on the square wave. So apparently there's some kind of 4 nanosecond jitter uh, between channel 1 and channel 2. So we'll have a little look at that and what it looks like on this particular generator because this one is sold with a feature that they're calling uh, the Magic Pulse, which supposedly solves this. Um, so we'll see if we can get it to uh, do that. Right, so I've been investigating this Magic Pulse feature, and it does look like they've fixed it. You can see we've got channel 1 and channel 2 offset uh, by a small frequency, and you can see here on the waveform that the sine wave is shifting in respect to the square wave nice and smoothly. And if we do the same on the square wave, you can also see that nice smooth shifting. On the rectangle wave, it's the same story, but on the trapezoidal waveform, you can see it is stepping by approximately 4 nanoseconds, so instead of that smooth shift, you are seeing that stepping, which apparently was apparent on the square waves previously. So it does look like they've fixed that feature, uh, but if you did need to be able to have that smooth shifting on a trapezoidal waveform, then maybe this waveform generator isn't for you. So overall, I don't think the function generator is too bad at all. It's certainly a nice improvement over the 3200S that I was using previously. Um, if I had one complaint in particular, it would be that the user interface is just too small. So if they just made the device a little bit bigger and had things like the wheel a bit larger, it would be a lot easier to use. As it stands, because the wheel's so small, it's actually a little bit difficult just to whiz it around like you would on a, another signal generator or at least if you had a knob rather than one of these dials, it would be a little bit better. And all of the buttons are a little bit close together. Not too much of a problem for me, but I can see a lot of people struggling because it's just so small. Um, when you use one of the Keysight devices or something like that, you get something much bigger, a little bit easier to use. So I might try and find an alternate um, dial for this that works a little bit better. Uh, but generally speaking, in terms of its operation, I've certainly got no complaints. Um, the jitter problem wasn't really a problem for me. I, it's very rare that I use both channels uh, and try and sync them. And when I do, I'm not looking at that kind of resolution. But I can see why it can be a problem for some people. Uh, but I would also suggest that if you are trying to look at um, things like that, a DDS function generator probably isn't the right tool anyway. You probably want a, f a pure uh, arbitrary waveform generator rather than a DDS type for various other reasons. But anyway, if you are interested in looking at this device, I'll put the link down below to the Banggood listing. You can make your own decisions on uh, the safety aspects. I am going to rework the, the power supply, so once I've found a suitable module to stick in there, I will do an update video on my fixes for it. Um, but certainly it's a good enough fix. We've got the mains earth connected to the BNC connectors like you would see on most equipment, um, so not really a problem. It's just that uh, the overall solution isn't quite ideal. So I hope you found the video useful, and until next time, thanks for watching.